Okay, I think we're live now. Um, everybody, you can type into um, all panelists uh, any questions that you have as we go forward. Uh, I'm Chuck Skews of Omen Sales, and with us today we have Jeff Carson from Marine Service Center, who's the premier Geno dealer on the west coast of the United States. So um, we're going to go over a few different things and I'll have Jeff introduce himself in just a minute. One of the things is, is if you take a break from the meeting, do not log out. It will lock you out of the meeting so or out of the webinar. So uh, just sh reduce it down if you need to break from the meeting rather than log out because I was told it will lock you out as, you, as we go forward. Now, uh, we're going to talk about the evolution of hull designs uh, and what it means for you and the evolution of sail designs and what it means to you. And all these things are to help you either in performance or in cruising or a combination of both. So uh, I'll give Jeff the wheel right now. He'll uh, start sharing his presentation and, uh, and then I will follow Jeff. Here you go, Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff Carson with Marine Service Center here in Seattle. And uh, we are the Genoa dealer for uh, model hulls, uh, sailboats. Uh, in Southern California and Pacific Northwest. And so what we're going to do is we're going to roll through um, sort of the um, evolution of sailboats more in the cruising line than just straight racing and start around in the 1970s. With that, I'll uh, put up my uh, PowerPoint here. And so first thing we want to talk about is Boats that were in the 1970s when we started really doing serious fiberglass boats. I don't, I don't see your presentation yet, Jeff. No, no. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. There we go. How's there that? There we go. All right. So um, in 1970s, most of the boats were set up as a dual uh, purpose. They were set up for both cruising and racing. And it was the beginning of the international offshore rating rule, which sort of defined designs for boats for the next decade or two. Um, in the 80s, basically we saw a refinement of IOR racing rules, which further influenced the design of the hulls and the rigs um, and made things go a little bit crazy for um, overall use of the boats. In the 90s, um, we're gonna be talking about uh, where boats started looking more based on basic cruising and less on racing. So they really focus more on designing a more comfortable boat for what most people use most of the time. By the 2000s, we're started talking about more dedicated cruising designs and far less racing. Um, and you know, it's uh, deciding to develop a better, uh, more comfortable boat. By 2010s, we're talking really fast cruisers. All pretense of racing those boats are gone. Uh, most of the uh, builders are either building specific race boats for the dedicated racers or cruising boats, and they don't really cross over as much. And now as we head into the 2020s, things are getting even easier. We're making the boats so they're very easy to sail. Um, so with that, let's take a look at the 70s. So what I have here, what we're showing is a Swan 40 from 1970. And you can see that it had, you know, a change of keels. It was no longer a full keel, but it's still a skeg hung rudder and a moderate rig with inline spreaders. Narrow boat um, and the accommodations weren't that great because it was pretty small inside. Lots of overhangs um, and very nar narrow hull designs. Looks a lot like the boats of the yesteryear. So it was very much following the same kind of shapes, but changing keel designs changing rudder designs and making it a little bit more powerful and a little bit uh, better sailing qualities, but still the small transoms, small cockpits um, and things like that. This is an IOR boat and you can see the sort of early uh, session of the um, IOR design where it's pretty moderate design, um, not too crazy on the beam and the pinching in the sterns in the bow. Um, so they were still fairly decent cruising boats. They went upwind extremely well. Um, downwind, not so much. They got a little squirrely because they didn't really have any form stability to them. So you look at a IOR boat like this where you have a very small cockpit, very extreme beam and narrow ends. The reason for that was they were designed to optimize rating rules. The rating rule um, 
was based on waterline and it measured it static at the dock. So the design, the designer said, well, if we make it so it uh, is very short waterline at the dock when it's standing still, we can then go and um, uh, add overhang. So when the boat starts healing, you pick up effective waterline, making it a faster boat. But it sure didn't do much for making it very comfortable. They healed a lot. And when he went downwind, because there wasn't any kind of uh, control on the transom, you didn't have any kind of squat down when he went downwind. They were very roly poly. So they had a lot of uh, broaching in boats like that. This is a boat that actually is called Tumble Home. You can see here this white is actually the hull, not the deck. And so the hull stuck out so far because um, that was a way to optimize the rule to get it so that it could really lean over. Didn't make for particularly comfortable boats for cruising, small cockpit, small transom, but they were effective for racing, which was primarily what they were doing uh, in that time. We're just gonna skip over the 80s because the 80s pretty much redefined and took the IOR to the extreme. You would see a lot of 80s boats like the CNC 38, where they've done all sorts of odd bumps and, and things on the hull to try and beat the rating rule. And it just got pushed to a point where the boats were no longer comfortable to sail. In the 90s, what you start seeing is a little bit less skeg, but still a protected rudder, a, a good keel um, that had uh, uh, some more lift to it. You still have inline spreaders, so you have to have more stays, baby stays, um, and a big overlapping Genoa. But you started picking up more beam in the uh, uh, after end of the boat. So you had one, more accommodations, the ability to actually put some more than just a uh, quarter berth underneath the cockpit. You could actually have double berths in a better, more comfortable cruising boat. And you can see here, that's that same boat on the hard. So a fairly you know moderate keel design, nothing compared to what we're radically doing today. Um, moderate overhangs and a good size rudder with a little bit of protection of a skeg. So you're still running a big overlapping head sail, masthead rigs. Um, the boats handled pretty well. You had more uh, form stability in these boats, so they would go downwind a little bit more comfortably. And they still went upwind pretty well, but you still have a big overlapping head sail that you have to tack around your spreaders. And you can see here, has a baby stay that you got to get the Genoa around as well as uh, lowers uh, forward and aft. When you started heading into the 2000s, we're still doing overlapping uh, head sails, but we're starting to get a sweep of spreaders. Um, we've gone to now a moderate beam and it's carried even further aft and to the point where we had to add twin wheels to a moderate 40 footer. This is a 40 foot uh, Genoa. Um, and what you find is, you know, we used to get comments all the time. It's like, this is a race boat and it's got twin wheels. But what started happening was as we extended the beam further aft and further out, a center wheel no longer gave you the ability to actually see your sail uh, trim and to control it from sitting outboard where you can actually see your sail trim. So going to two smaller wheels allowed you to better, um, angle through and get better sight lines for your sail trim, um, as well as it now allows you to get on and off the boat much easier because you don't have to climb around a big wheel. The uh, appendages started getting a little bit more uh, extreme. You're talking more straight up and down with the bulb around it on this boat and a fairly short cord, deep rudder. Um, still a fairly full bottom gives you lots of uh, upwind performance. Um, you're relying more on the bulb to keep you up as opposed to the hull form. One of the great things about these new uh, uh, deck layouts is you start having easy access from the transom, easy to get onto your kayak or your dinghy. Um, again, still overlapping head sails, but you have a sweep of spreaders that allows you to eliminate uh, standing rigging going forward. That's allowed us to uh, lighten the rigs um, as well as eliminate some of the standing rigging. So it makes it a little bit uh, less complex and a little bit more flexible for what you're doing. 
again, the same boat, same Genoa uh, 40 from 2000. And so you have a nice access to, uh, to the transom. They had lifting seats so you could get in and still be closed off. Um, nice side decks and a big cockpit. So you're getting in a much more comfortable cruising style boat than just something based on racing. But still in this era, they're moving the primary winches up forward, to try and spread out uh, what's going on in the cockpit. So if you are racing, you can have somebody here grinding and somebody driving and somebody working the main sheet. You know, by the end of the 2000s, we started seeing a new design trend coming in um, on the big builders, both Geno, Beneteau, and some of the others. You're getting the sweep of the spreaders, really good fractional rigs that give you a little bit more um, variation in your sail control, as well as the mast move forward on the boat. So it becomes more of a mainsail driven boat and less of a headsail driven boat. So you're looking at like 106 overlap on the standard Genoa on this boat. You started picking up um, hard chines, which were, you know, all the rage back in the, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, and even in the 50s when you came up with some, something like the T-Bird. It gives you uh, a couple of things. It gives you a, uh, additional interior volume by bumping out the uh, sides of the hull. But most importantly, it gives you form stability. So when you get onto this chine line, you start healing, um, you can't displace that water. So you accelerate as you get puffs and you tend not to round up or round down on these boats because they have more form stability. You still get a good size, big rudder, a big deep keel with the bulb at the bottom to give you more form stability. This is a seven foot draft kind of boat um, when you do the deep keel. And then notice when you start looking at the hull form, we brought the beam very far aft, almost straight back. And that gives you a lot more, again, form stability as well as interior volume. You've got a large cockpit, twin wheels, and a little bit better um, swim platform because now you have a folding platform instead of just stairs, which increase the amount of, of usable space in the cockpit. One of the things you'll notice here, they've gone from putting winches up here to spread out the loads to putting them right at the helm. They included a German sheeting system, which is a continuous line for the main sheet and it comes down both sides so that you have access to the main sheet at either helm as well as your uh, Genoa sheet. So with that, all the real sailing is happening in the back of the boat. So these people up here can now relax and they don't have to be a part of the sailing if they don't wanna be. You don't have to run up to the cabin top to adjust your main, um, to hit your traveler or anything like that. Again, you got that nice hard time and it runs to about 50% of the boat, 50% of the way forward. You have a, a deep, deep rudder, and again, a deep keel with a big bulb at the bottom. So it's definitely taken form stability, um, which gives you a better sailing um, characteristics for the boat. You sail more upright, less healing. Um, like I said, you don't have to worry about rounding up or rounding down as much because you have a smaller head sail and a much more balanced sail plan. One of the things that really helped with this is the fact that uh, designers and Computer power gets so much cheaper that we can now do fluid dynamics on these boats um, for even production builders and not just, you know, America's Cup racers. So now their ability to actually test out the boat on the computer before they ever strike a mold. And you have a nice swim platform here that folds down, keeping your, um, when you had the staircases before in previous generations, that took up a fair amount of cockpit space. So with having tailgates that fold down, now you get a big landing beach platform for your kayak or dinghy, but you also um, don't utilize the space, uh, waste the space. So again, much better sailing boat, small jib, big main, much easier to tack it. Um, on these boats, you can um, slowly pull in the uh, new uh, Genoa sheet and get it over and load it up before you even have to use a winch handle. So it's much, much easier than trying to deal with the 153 or 135. Moderate amount of heel on it, you just won't go any further. And with the fractional rig and bow spritz they put on these boats, now we had the ability to do factory code zeros. So instead of just having a spinnaker, 
you could now have a code zero on a furler uh, for off wind work, light wind, up wind work, um, and down wind work. Made it much easier to single hand and short hand sail these boats and uh, gives the cruiser sort of the performance of what racers have. Again, nice swim platform, hard time going forward, plumb bow, sort of changed the looks of boats. But one thing you'll notice on this that we changed in the next generation is the boom and gooseneck are very high. You've got mass steps to climb up there to zip up your sail bag. So this is probably about five and a half feet right there. Don't have to worry about hitting somebody's head in the cockpit, um, but you do have the center of effort fairly high up and the problems with trying to deal with a sail bag if you're a short person. 2018, and I'll just say the 2020s that we're heading into, this is the new and latest design by Jeannot. This is the um, Jeannot 440. Um, it's a, uh, uh, as you see, the beam has actually been carried further forward um, as well as straight aft. So it's a much more wedge-shaped boat. You've still got the twin helms. You've still got the inboard um, winches, German sheeting. So all your sailing controls are in the back. You've got a big swim platform and it falls down, uh, lowers down. Plus now you have twin rudders. So when you're healing, you have one rudder that's straight up and down, getting great um, control, not being um, blocked by the heel. And again, small head sails, big mainsail. The other thing that happened is we lowered the gooseneck. And so now that gooseneck is right at sort of hip level for a five foot 10 person. Um, so it's very easy when you have a conventional sail bag to be able to zip it up and access your mainsail. Now here's the boat out of the water. You can see from the previous generation, we've taken that hard shine and carried it all the way forward to the bow. This is what's sort of called a scow bow. It's a moderated version of what was been done in uh, racing boats like the Mini 6.5s. Um, they took it to the extreme of a, a scow kind of looking boat. But what we've done here is added more volume forward and this hard chine just above the waterline. So when you start healing, you pick up um, uh, form stability because you can't really go past that chine line. You can't displace that amount of water. And your sailing characteristics when you're going upwind with this scow bow is that the bow is actually out of the water. The first two feet of this bow, when you're sailing close hauled, is out of the water. And so you're skipping across the waves. You're more uh, heads up attitude. It's a much drier ride because the water hits this uh, flare just like it would if it was a power boat and pushes it off to the side. So you don't get as much spray up top. Um, you've got a fixed bow sprit that's attached, and so now you can put your code zero and your spinnakers off of there and have clearance. Again, a nice deep keel with the bulb at the bottom, and they don't have them on here yet, but twin rudders coming down. So you can see the twin rudders, the hard chine, and the fact that the bow attitude is up on a close hull kind of course. Now, this is really giving you a much better sailing characteristics much easier boat to single hand and shorthand sail, and a lot more comfortable for cruising. With the hull form getting wide and carrying the beam further aft, we've got a much larger interior. Um, we've got bigger hull ports here that now um, allow so much more light in there that you don't need to have the deck salons and style boats with that. So it's a much more modern design. Again, nice and uh, control, very easy to sail. And here's your one rudder where the other one is straight down, up and down. And you've got ultimate control. You can, on these boats, you can just let go of the wheel and 20, 25 knots of breeze, and it just keeps tracking. Big swim platform that folds down. Again, a huge cockpit. When you look at the distance between these wheels, and now we introduced a walk around side decks. So this deck slopes down to the cockpit level. So there's no climbing over combings. You can just walk forward. Ease of access is super great. Very easy to sail this boat when you get older, you have bad knees because you're not climbing over a high seat back. And the other plus is because you have the walk around side decks, we can make the seat combings really high. So you've got great seat support, back support when you're sitting uh, in the cockpit. 
So here you can sort of see all the boats side by side. You know, a 40 footer from the 1990s, it definitely tapers a little bit more. You have sort of a staircase um, transom to allow you access. You started gaining a little bit more beam further aft. And this 1990s boat had a single wheel uh, because it wasn't very narrow back here. You start picking up the dual helms, a little bit more beam and form stability. And then with the 409, you picked up the form stability aft. You got beamier and more wedge shaped going aft. And again, jib placement, uh, winch placement. And now you can see to the extreme how much more beam is carried forward now with the new generation of boats and that the beam is carried fully all the way aft. So you pick up a ton of form stability, much more comfortable boat to sail. Um, and it's a, it's a much quicker boat too. So while we're not racing, we're cruising, you know, we're seeing speeds on uh, the Genos, like the 410, which is similar hull form to this. Um, with the in-mass furling, we see 8.2 upwind, close haul. With the conventional main, we're seeing 8.5. And if you do the performance rig, which adds uh, three feet of mass to it, we're getting nine knots upwind, close haul. And this is a cruising boat with a full interior. So you can see the generations, you're, you're looking at probably six and a half knots upwind over here to now nine knots. And over this time, the rigs have changed too. Um, back in the uh, 70s, all the way up into the 90s, we had straight spreaders. Um, we had a lot of baby stays. We had stays coming off the uh, fore and aft to hold the mast up. So there was a lot more um, weight aloft. We started in the, the 90s with a swept of the spreaders and that allowed you to eliminate some of the standing rigging forward. Um, and while it did impact a little bit of your ability to lay the main out and a boom against the, um, the spreaders to go dead downwind, the hull forms that these boats are starting to show make it that their fastest point of sail downwind is not dead downwind. And then you start picking up, this is a Geno 39i, a little bit bigger sweep of the spreaders and more outward because we're not doing overlapping head sails as much. Um, they started putting the shrouds out on the outside of the hull to give you more, um, uh, more control over the shape of the mast and needing less um, weight aloft and a smaller cord of the mast sections. And this one is, this is a 49 foot Geno two spreaders, a cathedral rig up here. So it keeps the weight really low. You didn't have to put a third spreader for the super tall mast. Um, and allows you to really keep the, the weight down on this boat and still have a very stiff spar that you can uh, control really well. That's pretty much what I had. Um, Chuck's gonna take you into um, some uh, discussion on sail materials and where we're going and where we've been. Excellent. Um, I will share my screen as well. All right, so um, as a brief, I've been making sales for a little over 35 years. I've known Jeff for uh, a good 25 years, I believe. And, uh, and it's, I've been watching the evolution of these uh, hull shapes and, and rig shapes and everything is an incremental improvement and, and um and production boats you know start really started in the 60s and uh and then have gone forward unlike boats sails we started you know back in the roman empire days and the viking days and so it took a it the the growth in ours is, is a lot more monumental. And if you think about how sales were made in the old days, we have a criteria that we try to meet for sales. And this is why uh, it sort of explains why sales are the way they are. So first of all, they need to be lightweight because weight aloft is something. Um, they also need to be so they can hold shape rather than collapsing on waves or when the boat's standing straight up, them collapsing in on themselves. They need to be strong, obviously, so they don't tear. They can go over a wider range of wind. Low stretch has been something that we've chased for a long time. And mostly that's so that it holds shape, so that the design shape or the purpose-built shape in the sail, like the wing shape, 
blast through the wind range and as the wind increases. Uh, durability, obviously, so they last, so you're not replacing your sails every time you go out. And UV resistance has really come in because as um, boats are cruising more and more to the tropics, you know, uh, 30 years ago, it was kind of rare for someone to go off and sail to Tahiti. Now it's, it's hundreds of boats a year, uh, except for last year, obviously. But UV resistance has been something that we've worked really hard on uh, changing so that uh, sails will last longer down in places where people are spending most of their time. So uh, sail construction is, we have to anticipate dynamic loading. Not everybody is just going along and sailing in a smooth, controlled environment. And you can't damage your sails or have to replace your sails because of a mistake you've made. And since they're a flexible uh, you know, substrate, there's a lot of things that, we, that have to go into the thought process and the building process and the construction and the engineering so that the sales will last. And we, we have to anticipate people are gonna do something like this without it really shutting down uh, what is currently going on. Oops, am I muted? Oh, maybe smokes. No, Chuck, you're good. Okay. I just saw that. Okay. So anyway, um, this is how it all sort of started when we started going into, when they were building a lot of ships in the production level that they were doing. This is why sail lofts are called lofts. This is the upstairs of where they built the boats. A bunch of guys would, would hand stitch these sails together um, off of measurements they took off the boat. And then one master guy would figure out how the shaping would go and a bunch of, there'd be lines of guys uh, going together, uh, stitching the sail as they went. And everything was hand stitched at the time. It was built out of pretty heavy canvas. Um, obviously there was a few different weights. They went into Egyptian cotton much later and then uh, into polyester. Ironically, we still do some sales this way. This is literally three years ago, building sales for the Alaskan, or not the Alaskan Eagle, but the, the US Coast Guard's Eagle uh, square rigger that we, we did on our East, one of our East Coast lofts. So uh, the difference between this picture and this picture isn't radically different. So there are some things that, that just remain the same in sail making uh, over the years. Now, Sail technology overall has changed significantly. Uh, these are all fairly modern pictures, so we still do some things uh, like we've done in the past, but possibly a more improved version. This is a cross-cut Dacron sail or poly woven polyester. They don't officially make Dacron anymore. That's a DuPont trade name, but uh, this is a cross-cut sail. Uh, we then moved into triradial sails. And then more recently, uh, you've seen in the last 10 or 15 years, we've gone into what we call either membrane sales or string sales. And these sales have in themselves gone through some uh, evolution. So these are, um, all three sales are currently being produced and they all have their place as far as cost and durability and performance and, and ultimate uh, satisfaction for whatever the customer's use is. So um, I'm gonna kind of go into their cross-cut sails. The reason they were built this way and still are built this way is roll goods, what we call uh, woven roll goods, what we call Dacron comes in warp and fill directions, like an X, Y plot. The fill direction is a stronger direction. And the reason for that is those fill direction yarns can be held straight while the warp direction yarns, as you see in this slide, have to weave in and out. And so when you pull equal tension on both directions, you're gonna get more stretch in the warp direction than you are in the fill direction. And that's due to the way uh, you have to weave cloth. This is a you know standard uh, weaving mill and the threads come from an infinite direction like from you towards the screen. And then there's a shuttle that shoots crossways. A shuttle that shoots crossways can be pulled tight while the yarn's going the other way, then bend around it and then it shoots the shuttle the other way and it just keeps doing that until they weave thousands and thousands of yards of cloth. They have made some cloth that you can do in a warp direction in the woven, but generally it's not uh, what we consider a, a high 
a high quality, especially when you get into reefing. So um, then came along laminates and we now do laminates for cruising and racing. And with these laminates, they were allowed to make the cloth in the warp direction by holding the warp threads totally straight because they didn't have to be woven. They were laminated between two layers of uh, either scrim or taffeta or film or taffeta. And this allowed for making triradial sails. And then we also did it with race sails. Here's some film on film carbon. And we started making triradial sails. Shortly after we started making triradial sails with these laminates that had uh, generally very good stretch, uh, you know, resistance, great strength, um, and they were they're pretty stable. But the we dealt with the glues for years as far as delamination and lamination, and a lot of that has changed since then. Um, it also allowed us to use other fibers, fibers that we could not weave before. Now polyester, we wove because we made Dacron out of it. Nylon, we wove because we made Spinnaker nylon out of it. But Toron and Dyneema, Dyneema and Spectra are very similar. Toron and Kevlar are very similar. Um, Technora, which is a uh, very similar to Kevlar, but better in flex. Carbon, you obviously can't weave carbon, uh, you know, and have it as a stable, uh, stable textile without uh, without resin. So all these fibers allowed us, or all the lamination allowed us to use all these fibers. So race sales went in the early 80s, went from woven with some laminates, generally polyester, a woven polyester with a laminate on the outside to make it more stable, to the triradial built sales. And we started building triradials in uh, the mid to late 80s. And um, when we started building triradial sales, we also started being able to use computers to design them. We were still using old DOS system computers, but we started doing sale designs where we could duplicate a great performing or great efficiency sale over and over. And that was really a big turning point in uh, sale making where you could build exactly the same sale over and over. And the person sticking the sale together was more of a, a craftsman than an artist. They didn't have to know how the shaping went. They just had to know how to quality put it together, you know, be a, a more of a craftsman. And then when we, as things went on, we were able to test sales on the computer rather than building test sales and going out and testing them we could eliminate a lot of the R&D development with our testing, with our loading and, and learn how to transfer different weights to different sections of the sales. And this allowed us to then start using computer cutting. And this saved a lot of time, made things way more accurate, way more repeatable. And once we went to computer cutting, we then moved into actually plotting out the fibers per sale rather than rather than buying roll goods pre-laminated long stretches of cloth we are actually building sales from components purpose built each corner each edge of the sale was plotted in place versus uh, constructed from a roll of cloth and that's where we kind of are now and so this starts at this uh, this is our Cape Town facility and I'll sort of show you how that plotter that I showed you a couple slides back, how we've gone into plotting sales in full size. So this is, they put the carbon or the whatever fiber we're using on against this wall on all these little stands. And then this is the facility. If you see up along the top, this is where those strands of fibers go along the top. And then they come down and they go into this little, uh, we call it a pot. You can see it, it's a glue pot. So this takes those fibers, it coats the fibers with a glue, uh, gets them ready for setting. Then they are plotted right down onto the floor, onto a, what we call a skin on the floor. Then another skin is put on top and uh, a high heat, high weight laminator goes over the top of them. 
So this is how we're building sales now versus what we were doing years ago. And what you get is you get a super smooth, lightweight, strong, great shape holding sale. And we originally did this for racing, which is where almost everything ironically came in, in all boating aspects, even in power boating is they, they take what they learned in racing and mostly that's because of the R and D money is, is, was spent in there. And then we are like, well, how do we get this to last longer? And we're changing, uh, we're using fibers now that are a lot better flex and better UV. And then we're coating them with skins. The skins that we're using now are, we call them non-woven textiles. They're basically an array of fibers with a thermal set resin, which is a resin that's two part when it comes, when it's started and then it comes together and becomes one with a chemical bonding and the fibers are inside that. And that's the big difference from what you saw years ago when you were seeing sales that were delaminating as we called it. That was, those were thermal plastic resins. They were, they were heat set, but they were, they were only used as adhesion. So it was the same as if you laminated a countertop down on at your house or something. It was, it wasn't a solid unit. Now it's chemical bonding. It's actually chemical interlocking, so that these actually become one piece um, within about a week's time from when we laminate them and we let them set and we heat set them. They become one piece, and then with these skins on there, it completely blocks out the UV light from the sensitive fibers, and. It also adds abrasion resistance to the outside and it adds stability and the whole thing becomes a better product, especially for cruising. Um, and we have race boats that are even using this guys who don't want to replace their sails as often because the weight that we're adding is, is not as significant enough uh, to warrant the early wear out of sails. So uh, this is an example of, I believe this is a Catalina out there with a um, what we call membrane cell, our fiber path version. And you can see in certain lights, you can see through it and you can see the strings. And then this is what we're now selling to a lot of the big boats uh, and everything from probably 35 feet on. We're doing a lot of this style sales for cruising boats. And some of these guys are going around the world. Uh, we're testing it down in the Antarctic, uh, you know, we have been for the last five or six years with great results. Uh, it's very strong, very durable, great shape holding, uh, great UV. It's a, just become a great product. And this in combination with the new stiffer boats that Jeff was talking about, you just, the performance level of the boats just goes up exponentially. And uh, a lot of people think they don't need great performance when you have a cruising boat. But if you're going to do blue water crossing, uh, you know, five to six day window of weather is a great forecast. You go longer than that, it gets unstable. You want to limit the amount of time you're doing in your, in your passages and faster, more efficient boats are the way to do that. And not having sails break or having boats break, having reliable um, platforms your trip just goes much, much faster. I do a lot of uh, offshore racing and a lot of offshore cruising. And uh, believe me, it doesn't take that much to add one or two days to your trip. And having uh, having something that's a real efficient use of that is, is huge. So that's what I have. And I hope you guys have a great afternoon. And there are more uh, seminars, webinars coming from this Boats Afloat show. And I would imagine in the future, we're gonna do these even when we have real shows. Um, and I think we've hit our perfect time. If I don't know if there's any questions, I think uh, Katie was gonna field any questions if there was, and I don't see any. Nope, all right. Well, you guys have a great afternoon and we look forward to seeing you guys around. And if you have any questions, you can email me or Jeff directly. Jeff's at Marine Service Center and I'm at Ullman Sales. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for attending. Thank you so much, Chuck and Jeff. Thank you.